Ian Forster um, wrote To Connect. And really, TED is about storytelling. It's about my story, which is your story, which is my story again. So with that, I would like to share with you my story, if this works. So with that, I would like to share with you my story. As Sunny said, I was born in London, England. I am a true Londoner. This is my family. This is my mother in the 60s with a cigarette at my shoulder. <laughs> and my brother with the look of thunder because his gladiator hat has been taken off him and my father's holding it. My father isn't having, hasn't got a handbag. I was almost eight when I found my mother's body, the other side of her bathroom door. Her body was in a position that I could open the door and I could get my arm in to roll her, I thought. But I didn't have the strength to do it. And funnily enough, my arm didn't bend that way. So I could not move her. So the next best thing to do was to get help. So I called an ambulance. I called my aunt and said, you must come quickly because my brother and I are here and something's happened to mummy and she's dead. So in my family's wisdom, they wanted to protect us. They really, they had their own grief, but they wanted to protect us. So they told us that she was in the hospital, which was technically true. So then a few days later, when we, I was walking the dog past the hospital, they allowed me to take flowers into her. And they said that she was unable to take visitors because she wasn't up to it. Well, no kidding. So a couple of days later, we were in the family room. My brother wasn't with us, but my mother's entire family were. And I overheard a telephone conversation saying that, in fact, actually she had died and that she was being buried on the Monday. And the only way that I can describe what this felt like was if you've ever seen the atomic bomb, pictures of the atomic bomb, my energy left my body. It went out to the sides and it came rushing back in, up through, and it got caught here. And I was sat there thinking, <gasps> because what I had known to be true innately had been taken away. And then I'd found out that yet again, that was true. So I really didn't know quite where I was. And then with that, my brother, who was younger than I, um, he was five. So they said, don't tell him yet, because we're trying to deal with what's happening. And anyway, he's very young, he won't know. So for two months, I think it was around two months, I protected my brother like a Trojan. All of our friends knew, all of our school friends knew, everyone apart from him. And eventually I can remember going to my father saying, you have got to tell him, I can't do this anymore. This is just too dreadful. And they told him. So when we went back to school, I had a headmistress, Miss Fendi, who invited me up to her study. She was warm and encouraging and so lovely. And if any of you have got an English background, you'll know the delight of Jaffa Cakes, Bourbons, and custard creams. She gave them all to me, and a cup of tea, and a cuddle, and she was great. She talked about mummy, because no one at home was talking about her. It suddenly, it went. So she was talking, and I got to talk, and I was, it was normal, and I could laugh, and I was crying, and I shared with her that in my mother's bedroom, there was a portrait of her that I would go into, and I could see her, because you see, I didn't have that connection anymore. I couldn't see her, I couldn't touch her, and I couldn't smell her. But I had this picture. So I would go in, and I would cry, but I would also talk, and it felt good, because it was like I was talking to you. When I got home from school that day, the painting was gone. Miss Vendy had called my family and said, yeah, yeah this is upsetting Jo, this is you know, making her cry. Best we take it away. So they took the painting away. And you know, that painting didn't surface until I was about 17 again. They literally put it away. My mother was never spoken of. So with the funeral, we weren't involved with that, obviously, because they were trying to protect us from pain. They thought that as children, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to have pain, but we might have pain, so best not just circumnavigate it. And they did that through love. So we went off to a farm to play with lambs and cows for the day. And I can remember standing there thinking, I wonder what 
burial, what happens in a burial? What does my mum look like? And bearing in mind, my brother didn't know. So then fast forward that for a few years, and I was at boarding school in England, and we had homework time in the evening. And that was generally supervised by a senior. And you loved the seniors who would talk to you, who would stop you doing your homework. Because the idea was how all the, you know, silence, everyone working, and occasionally you'd have a teacher patrolling to make sure that actually that senior was doing her job. This evening, we had a fabulous senior because she talked to us and she was talking and talking and talking and she started sharing that her mother had died and that she had found her. Whoops. I cannot tell you what that felt like. I had not shared my experience with anyone apart from my headmistress, not a living soul. And here was a girl not much older than me, I thought at the time, and she, had, she knew what I had felt. She knew what I had seen. And she knew that, and she was living with that. And there I was. I felt so safe, I felt cocooned. And in front of my entire class, I shared my experience. And it felt terrific until I realized that the girl taking prep, her face had frozen and she was crying. And I was sharing my story and it felt good, so why wasn't she feeling the same until she admitted that she had made the entire thing up to entertain us. And I'm 45 and I'm standing before you and I'm flooded with memories of what that felt like. So you see, grief does change who you are and how you relate to the world. If you love someone and they die, you will miss them, whether you are in a field in Africa, whether you are in a mountain in India, or if you're in a suburb in North America. That person is important to you, and you are important to that person. So 11 years ago, the Lighthouse Program for Grieving Children was founded on the principle that within each of us is the innate ability to heal from, our wound, from wounds to our psyche. In the same way that we, we heal from physical wounds, you get a scratch, you, you, heal, you can heal from that. Emotional wounds are deep. They're not seen by everyone. And you have to learn how to go through life with that and without necessarily the help that is needed for that. Because as much as you will need a doctor for a severely broken leg, you will need some help for this. We live in a society now where people don't really have the time for that. As Scott was saying earlier, you have to make a decision to tell someone something. And then you have, what do you have with the backup, with your, your grouping around you? We all live in different places in the world. So the Lighthouse Programme. It gives children the sense of self back at a time in their life when they are terrified. Their life has been turned upside down and inside out. A child's primary relationship is with its parent. A parent is there to guide, to mirror, to nurture, and to keep safe. Now, when that's taken away, you have no security. You have no sense of self. And if you've had a sibling that has died, then you've spent, if anyone's got a sibling in here, you will know that you fight and you rough and tumble all the time. And if something, and you can say terrible things about your sibling, but if anyone else does, that's no, 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 no. We don't do that. That's so when they die, you have a sense of guilt that is with that because you want to be going on with your life and that's the other part of you that is missing as well. That's how, who you rough with. That's who you just get through your day with. So it is very, very important that children are with other children who understand what that feels like. Now there isn't anything wrong with you when you're grieving. And grief is an inner emotion that we talk about 
that you can't see, but you have, you feel it. So we have, um, we have groups, and they come into the groups, and they love to be with other children who've had that experience. In the same way that I was with that girl in that prep time, they love it. It's normal for them. They have had this experience, and they do need to integrate that moving forward in their lives so that it doesn't become damaging to them. I'd like to show you some pictures, I hope, of our groups and how wonderful it is to just be human and to connect with one another. We are human. Our human spirit is extraordinary. It can take us from the lows to the highs. We can recover. We are delicate, delicate beings. And when you've had something like this happen in your life, you are exposed, you are vulnerable, much as I am standing here. And if you don't feel safe and you wall that off, then how do you ever go on with your life and engage in your life and reinvest in your life and have strong, committed relationships? How do you do that if you don't know how to do that? So to be true to yourself, you need to know yourself. And how do you know yourself when you're cutting that piece off? So to be with other children and to be allowed in a safe environment where you can explore your fears, you can explore what is happening. And you're not taking responsibility for any surviving parents or siblings. What you're doing in that group is private. You are working out, you are not going to trigger someone else's emotional reaction. You are not there to look after anyone else and take protection for them. You're there for you. And the children who come through our groups are fantastic. We've had teens who come through as children and then they come back as volunteers to work in our groups because the impact for them was so great and so enormous and they can articulate it, that they want to be there for other children so that they can model survival for them at the time when they don't necessarily think that they can because children grieve differently to adults. If you go home and you're told that someone has died, you get it. It's a big, immediate picture. For a child, their cognitive development isn't there. So what does gone mean? That means that they're not coming back. Well, in six months later, that means that they're still not coming back. There's a, an accumulation of goneness for them. I kind of got stuck on this. Um, you can see that with grief and with children, it's intermittent. So it's very, very intense in the playground because no one else in the school has had that feeling and you're overcome with emotion. And then you want to go off and have ice cream, play basketball and jump on your brother. That is healthy. Grief is a natural and a healthy reaction to loss. And they are children. They're not 50-year-old men and women. They are children, and they should express themselves. And teenagers are defining who they are in the world. Part of their journey is to pull away from their parents at a certain time. So when they do that and, someone, and that parent dies, then who are they to pull away from? Are they my beliefs? Are they your beliefs? So you can see it's a very, very powerful very, very powerful thing to be with other people because it's humanity. It's being with one another and we are human and that is what we do. We don't sit there and think, okay, well, you're different to me so I just won't be there. When I look at you, I'm seeing me and you're seeing you and it's very, very powerful. So I'd like to close with a poem, a quote of a poem that is, I think, very explanatory if that's a word, to show you what it is that we do and how it is making a difference in children's lives and then the lives that they go on to lead. They will go on and have their relationships because they will have healthy lives. They will have their own children. They will live in different communities. They will live all over the world and they will take that peace with them. They will take that peace because they have been vulnerable. They know what that feels like. So when they see another being, they will give them that as well. It's a pass on. And the poem, the quote is, how did the rose give of its heart to the world? 
all of its beauty. I think I'm going to read it. How did the rose ever open its heart and give to this world all of its beauty? It felt the encouragement of light against its being because otherwise we all remain too frightened. And that is by the Sufi poet Hafiz. Thank you. <laughs>